Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the great introduction, uh, Gary. Uh, uh, you brought together an amazing group of people in this room. Everybody in this room, I think, could give this next presentation. Uh, the one thing I will say is I'm a psychiatrist, uh, and if you go back to the slide that we just saw from Michael about who prescribes opioids, psychiatrists do a lot of things that are maybe not terribly helpful, but we do not prescribe opioids. We weren't anywhere on this list. But we can help you, uh, you know, with helping uh, with the folks who are struggling with opioid addiction or who are at risk uh, for being uh, uh, at opioid addictions, and there are several of us here in the room Several of my colleagues, uh, Judy Turner, uh, Mark Sullivan, and more recently, Stephen Thilke and Carrie Stevens, who've actually devoted a good portion of their career to doing just that. Uh, so I want to acknowledge them uh, and point them out. Uh, the other thing I will say is much of what we're talking about really does stand on the shoulders of uh, the principles of chronic illness care uh, that many of us learned from Ed and Michael. Uh, and there is a couple people who could easily give this presentation. Actually, Wayne Caton should give this presentation, but Michael could give it, Elizabeth Lynn could, be, could give it. There are others here who could or should uh, do this presentation. Uh, so just want to acknowledge uh, that. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we should care about mental illness and substance abuse problems. Um, if you believe the guys who uh, are working at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation uh, on the Global Burden of Disease Study, they will tell you that 25% of all health-related disability worldwide uh, is caused by a mental health or substance abuse problem. That's huge, and it's growing, and it's way more than uh, the, the disability burden that comes with things like diabetes, heart disease, or cancer. These are things we all talk a lot about and do a lot about and spend a lot of money on. Uh, what does this mean for employers? So for employers, it means people who are having a really hard day, uh, and when they're having a really tough time, they can't make it to work. That's called absenteeism. And increasingly, we recognize there is maybe something that's even more complex, and that's uh, people are having that same hard day, and they are at work, and that's called presenteeism. So these are people who are at work, and everybody wishes they weren't at work. I think you know what I mean. We all have days like this, and we have people like this in our lives. Uh, very high health care costs. Uh, I'll show a slide about that in just a second. And for governments, it's more than just health care costs. It's costs related to homelessness, to involvement with the criminal justice system, uh, and lots and lots of other things that we uh, spend money on. On a personal level, uh, mental illness can kill you. Uh, we have in this country now a suicide about every 13 minutes. There are three people a day in the state of Washington who uh, end their life uh, by suicide, uh, and uh, there are more suicides than there are homicides, there are more suicides than there are motor vehicle accidents. For every person who uh, commits suicide, there are 10 people who make a suicide attempt, and for every one of them, there are 10 people who are thinking about it very seriously and, and truly are miserable and they're suffering and their families are suffering. If you uh, think about it, uh, I actually have not ever met a family that hasn't been touched by a mental health or substance abuse problem in some way. Uh, so this is a very personal thing, but it's not the kind of thing that most of us are actually all that comfortable talking about yet. So that's why I'm glad that you're having us talk about it uh, here. A little bit about health care costs. These are costs borne uh, for health care by insurers. Uh, these are uh, uh, based on uh, uh, millions of health care claims. And what uh, they did here in this actuarial analysis, they looked at uh, the cost PMPM uh, for different payers uh, for people with or without one or more claims for behavioral health condition uh, in the past year. And you can see uh, across the board, uh, people who have uh, one or more behavioral health claims in a visit diagnosis, the costs are 273%. For a Medicaid population, I think it's over 300%, 341%. So this is a lot of health care. And most of this health care is not mental health and substance abuse care. Only about 3% uh, is. So this is Lots of everything, lots of drugs prescribed, lots of ER visits, lots of primary care, uh, lots of inpatient uh, medical care. Uh, now, uh, one way in which behavioral health and substance abuse conditions are really quite different from everything else in health care, uh, we don't have a lot of access to care. Many of you know this. Uh, so just to show this, uh, I'm going to use a technique I learned from Doug Zatzik, who's sitting in the front here, which is to show epidemiologic data uh, with 
these cute little people. So we are in the state of Washington. We have about 7 million people. There's about a million of us on any given day who are uh, diagnosable uh, with a mental health or substance abuse condition. And if you think about these are all that million people. Uh, sometime between now and a year from now, about 10% of them will see a psychiatrist, somebody like me. Now, you might say, okay. Uh, so for those of us who are psychiatrists, that's not very encouraging because that means we have a pretty minimal impact uh, on people who really need us. Now, you might say there are lots more mental health providers than psychiatrists. There are psychologists. There are social workers. There's chemical dependency counselors. There's lots of people who are in the business of treating people with mental health problems. If you add them all up, uh, about 20% uh, will see somebody who has training to treat a mental health or substance abuse condition in the next year. How would we feel if this was cancer? What if we said there is a million people with cancer in the state of Washington, and uh, sometime between now and next year, one out of 10 will get to see an oncologist or some other cancer provider? We'd find that totally unacceptable. But as I just showed you, the burden of illness that comes from mental health and substance abuse condition actually much greater than uh, what comes from cancer. So just to keep that in mind. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, primary care earlier today, and uh, here's the good news from my perspective. 40% uh, of people who live with a mental health or substance abuse conditions will say, I've had some treatment for this problem by a primary care provider. Now, uh, some of my colleagues would say, you know, the treatment isn't very good, it's not enough. Uh, I, I, I'm a glasses half full kind of person. I see that as a tremendous opportunity. I, I appreciate the fact that these primary care docs, uh, you know, they know that they have poor access to us. Uh, so they go about and they do the best they can to treat. 60% of people will have no formal treatment whatsoever, and that's, you know, anything, even one session with a social worker, a pastoral counselor, anybody who says, I'm going to try to help you with your mental health is included here. 60% will have nothing. If it's a pure substance abuse condition, it's even worse. It's only about 10% who will really actually get substance abuse care. Um, what about the quality of care? So uh, we're an interesting country, and this is not true. It's true for opioids. We are a country that loves to take pills. Uh, about 30 million times a year, somebody will walk out of a primary care doctor's office uh, with a prescription for a psychiatric medication. Uh, and if you follow those people, uh, about on average, about one in four people will be significantly improved a year later. Uh, so there is the glasses half full, a lot of prescriptions. Uh, and I don't know if you can read this slide. I think this may be my only cartoon. It says, of course you feel great. These things are loaded with antidepressants. We are loaded with antidepressants. I can guarantee you there's a whole bunch of people in this room right now who are loaded with antidepressants, which is not that comfortable talking about it yet. Uh, the flip side of this is when you look at those who are living with severe and persistent mental illnesses, those who have schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, who are treated primarily in the mental health specialty system, uh, those folks are uh, having very high mortality rates. They're dying in their late 40s, early 50s, the average life expectancy of somebody with schizophrenia in this country, uh, in this state, uh, is somewhere in the mid-50s. Uh, and they're not dying, for the most part, from suicide. They're dying from strokes and heart attacks uh, and uh, uh, poorly managed diabetes and hypertension. So we have lots and lots of uh, opportunities to not improve just only access but also quality of care. Uh, the last slide I will say uh, in defining the problem is we are now talking a lot about patient-centeredness, patient-centered care, whole person care. Uh, everybody's got that somewhere in their uh, materials. Uh, and when you really look at it, we are not doing very much patient-centered care. This is a slide I showed about seven or eight years ago uh, at a meeting uh, where the secretary uh, uh, for health was in the audience, and she got up, uh, and I said, these are silos. I grew up on a farm. I like these kinds of agricultural metaphors. And she got up, and she said, in my office, these things are not called silos. These things are called cylinders of excellence. Uh, and, and I thought about that for a while, and I thought, she's actually absolutely right. So I laughed, like you laughed, and then I thought, she's right. Uh, we all go to work every day in a cylinder of excellence. And we got to go, we work with these really challenging patients and we got to go to work and we got to tell ourselves this is difficult work, this is God's work that I'm doing here. Uh, and I have a QI machine and we make it better every day. And it's true for what it is we're doing in our silo. It is probably fairly excellent. But uh, when you look at uh, what a patient says, and this is a quote from a patient of mine, this is a middle-aged man uh, with schizoaffective disorder. 
uh, who actually was quite functional. He held on to a job for a long time until about 2008 when the economy crashed and he lost his job and he was unemployed and he was going to the GAU program where he was getting primary care services and some mental health services. Uh, and he said to me, you know what, man? He said, I've never been this stressed out in my life. Now that I don't have work, I have so much stress. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you know what? I'm supposed to go to medical treatments for my diabetes and hypertension, to mental health care, to a substance abuse treatment. This guy uh, drank uh, quite a bit too much. Uh, and I'm supposed to go to social services. I'm supposed to see a ran out of silos here. I'm supposed to go to housing services and vocational rehab services, and I don't have good transportation. And just coordinating all of this, I'm like going nuts, he said. Uh, and he tried to explain to me how this all worked, and I thought, gee, I'm a guy with multiple graduate degrees. I'm a pretty smart guy. I couldn't figure this out. So this is what we create for our patients. We spend lots and lots of money on this problem. Uh, and somewhere along the way, uh, you know, the guy who had a pretty bad uh, low back problem uh, will find an opioid, uh, and then we have a huge challenge, right? And where does the silo go that takes care of that? So I think these are really the challenges uh, we're up against. So. Lots of, uh, probably spend half of my presentation on defining the problem. That's not good. Let's talk a little bit about solutions. Uh, how could we close this gap? So I think we've all recognized doing more of what we're doing, more silos, better silos, maybe not going to get us where we need to go. So I think a couple of thoughts. Uh, we need to work smarter. We need to say those of us who do know something about behavioral health care, we got to leverage ourselves better. It's not okay for us to say we can help one in five people who have this problem. Uh, that's not a solution. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to partner with people, we need to collaborate, we need to collaborate in primary care, in workplace health settings, in uh, schools. Uh, the other thing that we are increasingly using, we can use technology. Uh, so we can use telehealth care uh, to port a mental health provider into virtually any clinic, even very rural clinic in the states, and we're doing a fair amount of this uh, now. Uh, the other thing we have to do is we got to figure out how do we get upstream. Uh, I think what we do in mental health care is we treat a lot of what is sort of the mental health equivalent of stage four cancer. Uh, so when a person is admitted uh, psychotic on a gurney uh, to the emergency room at Harborview, that's a stage four cancer. There are 10 years of stuff that happened before that person ended up there, uh, you know, that we may have, should have done something about. So if you think about my cancer analogy, uh, 30 years ago we were treating a lot of stage four cancer. Uh, and people said cancer is a horrible disease and it's stigmatized and if you get it you're going to die and the treatments are horrific and for the most part they don't work. That's kind of what mental health looks like today. We're treating a lot of stage four cancer. What are we doing in cancer? We're trying to prevent cancer. We're trying to find in primary care a stage one cancer and we get all over it. Uh, and That's our best shot and we've made a huge dent there. Uh, so that's I think uh, what we need to do uh, in mental health as well. Uh, you know, many of you have seen this. This is really the work of Wayne Caton and Michael Von Korff and Elizabeth uh, Lynn and others uh, at Group Health, now Kaiser, uh, that uh, got together 20-some years ago and I said, if we put behavioral health into a primary care office, what would it look like? This is what it looks like. You take a primary care provider and you give them a behavioral health professional in the office that works alongside them. Uh, you put a bunch of tools in place. You say every time somebody comes in, we're going to see how bad the problem is. You measure with a PHQ-9 depression. You teach that behavioral health provider some evidence-based, brief, structured interventions for how to treat because a pill is good, but the pill won't change your life. You need to make changes in your life uh, that may be facilitated by that pill, but somebody has to work with you on making those changes, and a PCP is often too busy to really do that well. Uh, we have to track people on the registry. We have tons of people falling through the cracks. That guy I talked about, he fell through the cracks tons of times. If I hadn't keep, kept up with him, he would have gotten lost a million times along the way. We have to have ways, tools to keep people on track. And then, uh, you know, not everybody needs to see a psychiatrist, but uh, those of us who are struggling with patients who are not getting better, that's the person you want your psychiatrist or psychologist to weigh in on. Those are the cases we all should be talking about. That's collaborative care. Uh, we built some tools to do this tracking. This is called a registry, very, very important. We did research. This is a big randomized controlled trial, one of 80 uh, by now, that has shown that if you do this kind of collaborative care, uh, you can more than double the likelihood that a person with something like depression will be significantly improved a year out. Uh, we also learned along the way that if you do this right, you can, in fact, save health care costs. This is uh, uh, both published in 2008. Uh, this is reflecting data from Kaiser and Group Health. 
uh, cost accounting data for people cared for in a uh, randomized control trial, half of them were getting usual care, half of them were getting collaborative care. And what we learned uh, four years out is for every dollar we spent on collaborative care, we saw about a six and a half dollar reduction in total health care costs four years out. Uh, this was uh, um, uh, as a brick summary of the impact study we did. We learned along the way that you can not only get better access to care, you can improve uh, mental health outcomes, you can reduce physical pain. Elizabeth Lynn published a paper in JAMA from the study that said people had less functional impairment from physical pain if they had this kind of collaborative care for depression. Uh, you get better functioning and you get lower health care costs. We published all of this in a whole series of papers before I think Don Berwick had spoken the word, uh, um, uh, the triple aim, but this is the triple aim. Uh, you know, so if you do this well, if you do good behavioral health care, uh, you can actually get after the triple aim. I actually think you can get after the quadruple aim because providers are also pretty happy uh, with this kind of uh, care. All right, so lots of other studies have demonstrated this, in fact, is a pretty robust way to try to improve behavioral health care. The Wall Street Journal wrote about it a couple of years ago. And in fact, uh, what I can tell you is if you want to get attention to something, don't published in JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine. That little article in Wall Street Journal got us more mileage and attention than anything else. So that's what people are really reading. So get your stuff published in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there's an organization called the Kennedy Forum that has done a really nice summary just a year ago. This is pretty current of all of the literature in this area that I could recommend to you if you'd like to learn more. Uh, we've developed about 10 years ago at the University of Washington a program called the AIM Center. The AIM Center works with organizations really in the state and across the world to try to help implement these kinds of uh, principles of effective care. And we've learned a lot about it along the way. Uh, we've written a nice little book. Uh, uh, that's actually something that Wayne and I started together and Anna Ratzliff and others helped us finish up. That really is about how do you do this kind of team care for depression. There's a nice chapter in that book about uh, chronic uh, uh, pain. Uh, so for those of you who like to think about what does that really look like, uh, it might be a useful resource. Uh, we have uh, committed to doing this kind of integrated work at our own healthcare system. Uh, we started this at Harborview in the clinic that Dan Lesler was working and we now have it in 20 of our neighborhood clinics. Uh, we partnered with the Community Health Plan of Washington and we have provided this kind of uh, integrated care uh, in a network of over 100 primary care clinics across the state of Washington. Uh, learned a lot about this. Uh, we uh, started this program uh, and uh, early on what we learned is we were having a lot of people in treatment for depression. That's the blue line here. This is a survival analysis. And it took a year for half of the people in care to get better. And I was very unhappy with that. So we said to the health plan, what about putting 25% of the money that you pay to these clinics at risk for doing one of two things? Either show us that you got the patient's PHQ-9 better or get a psychiatric consultation and get a change in treatment to happen. And when we did that, uh, what we did is we shifted this curve way over to the left. That red line is 6,000 patients uh, and same clinics, same patients with much more active treatment management. We were able to reduce the time that it took for half these people uh, to have their depression improved from over a year uh, to just a little over 16 weeks. Big, big change. Uh, my last slide here, a couple of principles that I think uh, hold up across all of this kind of work. The first one is it really does have to be patient-centered. We've got to get out of these silos. The patient has to be able to feel like these people are all talking to each other. I'm not uh, talking about different things to lots of people. The second one is the notion of committing to a population. We're all trying to figure that out right now. You have to have a tool, a registry, some way of knowing who is the person who is not coming back. Because the people who keep coming back and show up in your waiting room, they're probably the people who need you the least. It's the people who are not coming back, who are really struggling, that you've got to be able to go after. We have to do evidence-based care. We still provide lots of pain care, lots of psychiatric care, lots of primary care that if you look at it, it's not really evidence-based. And the fourth principle is having a target. You know, this is something that I learned from everybody in primary care. In behavioral health care, we would just say, how are you feeling? And the patient says, I'm feeling a little bit better. We'll say, great, let's do another session. Uh, now we don't do that anymore. We say, what is your PHQ-9? How are you eating? How are you sleeping? And when you have a target and you manage to that target, you can make a huge difference. I think if you can do all four of these, we can really create uh, accountable care and go after the triple or quadruple aim. Thank you.